Welcome to our roundtable on the liberal international order, a moment of crisis. It's, it's wonderful to have you all here this evening, this afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Leslie uh, Binjabari, director of the US and America's program here at Chatham House. And it's an honor and a privilege to be welcoming you all for um, this panel discussion with a remarkably distinguished set of contributors uh, it is also, as we were just saying to each other, a really nice moment to be able to reflect on a question that I feel we spent the first two years, possibly three, of Donald Trump's presidency talking about in a really rigorous, really serious way. And perhaps in, in the recent weeks and months, we've descended into campaign and electoral land. And so what a wonderful moment to be able to take a step back and, um, and it's hard to think of a, a better scholar to, to begin this conversation. The reason that we're having today's roundtable, which I should say is on the record and is being recorded, uh, is to honor John Eikenberry's most recent book. It's a love, it's, in addition to being just beautifully written and a really important book, it's just also aesthetically really a beautiful book, uh, A World Safe for Democracy liberal internationalism and the crisis of global order. Um, it's a great book for reading during the pandemic as well. And I always like to say, um, I think Mick Cox gave it such a nice comment and I like to read it out. I was with John on his panel at the LSE and I did the same thing, so sorry, John. Uh, John Eikenberry once more shows why he remains the most intelligent and most articulate defender of a world built over two centuries by Britain and the United States yet another tour de force by one of the most important voices in international relations today. Um, and it is true, this is, John, John has written eight books. Um, they've all, the last three for sure have been quite path-breaking and, and formed, uh, informative in the field of international relations and far beyond. So it, it really is a pleasure and an honor. John is currently the Albert, Albert Milbank Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University, which is where he is now and today. Um, he is going to be followed by a very distinguished set of contributors to our discussion. Um, Gideon Rockman, well known to all of us, chief foreign affairs uh, commentator at the Financial Times since 2006. And his most recent book, if you haven't read it, you should, in 2016 was Easternization, War and Peace uh, in, the, in the Asian Century. Um, after Gideon, we will have Linda Yu, who is uh, a writer, a broadcaster, an economist, an associate fellow on the U.S. and America's program at Chatham House, a visiting professor uh, at LSE Ideas, and many hats. Her latest book was The Great Economists, How Their Ideas Can Help Us Today. Uh, and she's also an advisor to the UK Board of Trade, so plenty um, to bring to the table. And then Hans Kunani. Uh, my colleague, senior research fellow on the Europe program here at Chatham House, um, previously at the German Marshall Fund in the US, uh, a research director of the European Council on Foreign Relations and author of The Paradox of German Power. He writes also extensively on democracy in Europe, the future of democracy and questions of America and populism. So we couldn't have a better panel. And we also have an extraordinary audience with some really distinguished um, scholars and thought leaders. So I'm really looking forward to this. John, I'm going to not even say anything. I've been doing so much talking lately, and I'm so excited to listen to you uh, talk about the big questions of a world safe for democracy, what, how we, what we might make of the current moment and um, the historical context that's, that's taken us here and where we're going. So over to you. Thank you, Leslie. And thank you, uh, panel of colleagues and friends. It's so great to see you, uh, at least virtually. And thank you for joining this uh, panel to talk about the, these big issues. And I will start by just giving an overview of, of my book and where I'm coming from. I began this book at, uh, with a series of lectures at uh, University of Virginia on the crisis of liberal internationalism, the, the month after Trump was elected. And uh, you could see at that moment, and perhaps still can, the kind of real-time ongoing breakdown of, of the uh, uh, US-led international order, a kind of crisis manifest as a lost confidence in common 
responses to common problems, a sense of a kind of world historical moment that it's not just another bump in the road, that there is something um, uh, 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 discontinuous about this historical moment, that something is, is giving way to something else. Uh, we are breaking down in a, in a more profound sense than in the past, perhaps. And certainly the great questions are on the table like they haven't been uh, really in a generation. Questions about the, the nature and sources of global order. What, how do we build it? How do we maintain it? Uh, does liberal democracy uh, um, have a, another go? Uh, can it, can it uh, make a comeback? Uh, can capitalism and democracy be reconciled? The tensions seem greater than ever. Uh, and can the liberal internationalism, a, a kind of a tradition of a cooperative organization of the world system be uh, uh, maintained or reinvented? Uh, and as I ask in the book, uh, uh, where in this current period can the flag of liberal internationalism be planted? And so my lectures at UVA uh, really turned uh, uh, backwards in asking about the future. I increasingly wanted to look uh, to the past and take the long view, the long uh, uh, view back for, you might say, a usable past, a, a kind of set of lessons and insights that we might have from earlier eras uh, about, uh, about that can be brought to our current moment. Uh, and looking back, you see that liberal internationalism and indeed the story of liberal democracy uh, is much more of, of one of, of struggle and contestation than, than triumph. Liberal order, liberal internationalism did not begin in 1989, nor even in 1945. It has a longer 200 or really 250 year uh, tradition. And so I'm interested in this book in looking at those, uh, uh, those ups and downs, the golden eras and the catastrophes uh, the deep contestation, the, the close run moments, as Arthur Schlesinger uh, talked about the 1930s, when uh, it wasn't clear that democracy would last, a kind of extinction moment. And indeed, the 1930s and 40s have kind of haunted me in writing this book. Uh, I was very influenced uh, by a book by Ira Katz Nelson, the Columbia uh, political scientist, a book called Desolation and Enlightenment, where he looks at liberals in the 1940s, who in that own, in that generation um, were contending with upheavals that included the Great Depression, the rise of totalitarianism, of fascism, um, uh, the rise of total war, the Holocaust, and the dropping of the atomic bomb, all in one historical cycle. And he talks about how liberals picked up the pieces and looked for a pragmatic kind of world weary way to put these open societies back together. And so in this book, I'm trying to, to look back and, 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 and make an argument along three lines. First, I'm trying to convey a sense of weight and, and really gravitas politically and intellectually to this tradition of thinking. It's not just things that politicians said in the 1990s in the wake of the end of the Cold War. It's a deeper tradition of ideas and experience. Uh, secondly, to, 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 to talk honestly about it, to, to acknowledge its, its advantages and its accomplishments, and I can do that all day, uh, but also its failures. Uh, the, the moments, particularly recently, the 2008 financial crisis, perhaps the Iraq war implicated internationalist elites as well, and, and to, to look at how we might rebuild the coalition and the project. And then thirdly, to, to uh, show inside of this tradition of 200 years, a kind of pragmatic, opportunistic, reform-oriented tradition that's not about celebrating the inherent virtues of liberal democracy and its international projects, but it's, it's a workaday ability to pragmatically tackle problems that we share in common. So those are the three things I try to do in this book. Now, the question, obviously, the first question is, well, what is liberal internationalism? And I find that it's a lot of things. It's not one thing. Um, and I take the inclusive view in trying to put uh, in and sort out the different uh, aspects of the threads of this tradition. It, it reminds me of Tacitus's um, uh, uh, way of describing uh, the Roman Empire. It's rich in, in vicissitudes. And so, too, is the liberal international 
tradition. Now, famously, Woodrow Wilson gave us the one-liner that we associate with liberal internationalism to make a world safe for democracy, his war speech to Congress in 1917. And that's been interpreted as a call to spreading democracy worldwide, a kind of idealist crusade. But I argue that you can read that, that phrase differently. The second reading of to make the world safe for democracy and in, in, in making literally the world safe so that democracies can survive those that, that currently exist. And it's the second reading that I take to be the, the more essential reading that, that the liberal international project in its essence is to create a, a, a kind of ecosystem or an environment or a geopolitical space so that liberal democracies can, can survive and do their thing and protect their way of life that manage their mutual vulnerabilities and balance what is at what is at the heart of liberal democracy which is a bundle of tensions in their values Liber liberty and equality individualism and community sovereignty and interdependence um, it's an ongoing struggle often a tragic choice kind of struggle between alternatives creating a zone of cooperation for doing that ongoing work now liberal internationalism has its core convictions that openness is good, properly managed, that's trade and exchange. Institutions uh, can facilitate cooperation, would be a second uh, claim or conviction. Um, that uh, uh, democracies have a special capacity and set of interests and values that would lead them to cooperate. We may want to talk about that today. Uh, and then fourthly, in an era which we describe as modernity of rising economic and security interdependence, countries starting with liberal democracies can't manage those uh, vulnerabilities alone. They can only be, uh, or to use what I think is the touchstone insight of liberal internationalism, you cannot be secure alone, you can only be secure uh, together. So liberal internationalism as a kind of um, program for making the world manageable in the face of modernity. Now the book, uh, if I can just continue on a little bit, the book, um, talks about 200 years and uh, 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 beginning with the Enlightenment and the age of democratic revolutions, the four kind of big historical revolutions that liberal internationalism navigated and that have been the, the problems and the, the, the landscapes and terrain upon which uh, activists and other agents have uh, pursued the project have been fourfold. One is liberal democracy itself, which has moved from its origins in the late 19th century, kind of the Republican constitutional era into the modern era with changing and expanding rights and inclusiveness, uh, uh, democracy born little uh, white men of property to, to a more inclusive societies. That, that's true within liberal democracies. It's true uh, among the, the community of democracies as well, uh, creating that kind of carton, that kind of ability for the international system to support liberal democracy, like eggs needing an egg carton. The shift, secondly, from a world of empire to nation states, this has been liberal internationalism struggle. What, what side are we on? And it's been on both sides, as I argue in this book. Thirdly, the rise of e and cascades of economic and security interdependence, which I mentioned, the idea being, of course, to harvest the upside of modernity, because uh, there's much there to want and to innovate with, but also to protect from the downside. That's liberal sponsored global governance. And then finally, navigating two eras of hegemony, the Anglo-American eras, uh, and that too, tying liberal internationalism to great power politics. One of the themes in the, in the book is that liberal internationalism is not a, a big worldview that a majority of the world will sign on to it. It's, it's like a, a flag without an army. It, it needs coalition partners. It ties itself to other forces in history. And indeed over 200 years, it's tied itself to nationalism, to empire and imperialism, to, to great power politics and to Anglo-American hegemony. It's, it, it's a kind of parasite that needs a host uh, uh, to put it somewhat unpleasantly, but it, it is in all these different ways working with other forces. And that's both the good news and the bad news. Finally, let me just say in, in the last of my remarks, uh, what, 
what's gone wrong. Now, uh, I, I start out by arguing, well, it's, it's in some sense, the problems of liberal internationalism and liberal order are problems of success, not failure. Uh, uh, they're, they're Carl Polanyi problems, not E.H. Carr problems, if you will. They're problems of the over uh, expansion or the, the, the overflow of and mobilization of social forces beyond the political frameworks and bargains that supported their, their initial movements. But it's an argument I make in the book, and I wrestle with a lot in thinking about Biden and the next era, is, is that liberal international order really began as a subsystem of a larger system during the Cold War. Its, its golden era was, was, was defined in opposition to alternative uh, modernity projects. It was a club. It had contingency to membership. It's, I, I won't go into this, but one of the ways that, uh, that enforcement of rules and, uh, and the ability to get states to cooperate, the innovation that Roosevelt had was that we're going to put you in a club and give you benefits for being in, but if you don't behave, we'll kick you out. That wasn't something that Wilson had in mind when, when in his generation, when they thought about liberal order, the club character, the logic of conditionality, calling it a free world, giving it valoration, mutual aid society, being inside was to have advantages, to be a, have access to technology and assistance, and certainly security. But what happened with the end of the Cold War, the inside order became the outside order, uh, a kind of breakdown of the club character. We celebrated that because once again, as I said earlier, liberalism as a kind of vision of society is a ever more inclusive, a work in progress, read Barack Obama speeches, you're always wanting to expand. It's an imperfect union. Read Obama's eulogy for John Lewis. We have been given uh, an imperfect union and instructions for making it better. And we're gonna do what we can, and then we're gonna hand it on to our, uh, to our heirs. Um, and, and so too, the idea of expanding the liberal order after the, after the Cold War was, was necessary. You can't woulda, shoulda, coulda about China. You had to uh, have a logic of inclusion, I think, but it had an effect on the logic of the order. It made it less of a club, more of a, what I say in the book, a shopping mall where you could kind of walk in and get these advantages. You can join the WTO, but not sign on to the human rights. Um, uh, you can wander in and pick and choose. So just to end, I would say that um, uh, that's kind of where we're at. I, I, and I, at the end, I say I worry about simply giving up on the higher order aspirations of liberal order because it, those people who live in advanced industrial societies that want to have values associated with limited government, free speech, flow of information, accountable government, civil society beyond the reach of the state, if those are things we want to preserve for our children, and want to see somebody enjoying at the end of this century and after we're all gone, how do we protect them? I do think that you have to protect them by not giving up on the project and not simply surrendering and saying, well, we'll just live in a world where it doesn't matter what your regime type is. We'll, we'll call that Westphalian internationalism. Uh, and I, what I say at the end of the book is we have to live in that world. That's certainly the entry level order that we should strive for, sovereign equality, multilateralism. But, but if you have, as Headley Bull called it, higher social purposes, you need to uh, build a, a, a more like-minded uh, uh, coalitions where you can sustain things that you care about that the larger Westphalian order will not sustain, human rights, some aspects of modern political economy, perhaps environmental job standards and other things. So we have to play a two level game uh, of, 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 as I think Biden will do, of, of trying to, to rebuild the coalition without turning it into a cold war against China while simultaneously realizing that everything, uh, that all the, the really tremendous global problems are indeed global and that we need everybody working because you can't be 
uh, secure a loan. So I'll just end, I know this is the America program at Chatham House, so I'll end with just a reference to Ben Franklin, uh, who on July 4th, 1776, uh, uh, said uh, to his fellow colonial representatives, um, uh, we at this moment will need to hang together because if we don't, we will certainly hang separately. And so that's my message that uh, that flows from this 250 year uh, recounting. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was masterful. And in your last few comments, you certainly um, highlighted the tension, rebuild, hang together, but don't make it a cold war against China. And yet at the beginning, you said it was formed, liberal orders were formed in opposition, in opposition to things. So clearly the tension is there. Um, Gideon, for you to unpack and elucidate and share your views. Thank you very much, Leslie, and thanks, John. That was that was fascinating, and also thanks for uh, spent a very pleasant afternoon with your book, which is a fantastic alternative to spending the usual afternoon wasting my time on Twitter. So that that was great. Um, and um, congratulations on the timing of the book. It really couldn't be better timed. Uh, you know, with Biden uh, winning, uh, suddenly the questions that you're discussing are very kind of alive again uh, in a way that I don't think they would necessarily have felt in the middle of the, the Trump era. Um, and it seems to me that this is a, a book about, in a way, the, certainly the forward-looking bits of the book, uh, and I, I, you make the point it's, it's, it's mainly historical, but to frame the forward-looking bits. Uh, the forward-looking bits are a kind of, seem to me a moderated liberal internationalism for a post-Trump world, a more, more modest liberal internationalism which is different from the kind of triumphalist version post-1989, one which, as you say, takes account of what went wrong afterwards, but seeks to, um, if you like, rescue the core and to, pro to promote it. Um, and I think that you've also led upon a more conservative with a small c definition of liberal internationalism, the, the, those two definitions of what's safe for democracy might mean, the, the one you've opted for, is the more defensive version rather than the more uh, kind of crusader type version that we're gonna convert the whole world to our ideals. It's more what we have, we hold, we protect and we advance gradually, but uh, it's really as much about protection as about um, advancing and universalism. And I think that captures the mood of the moment. And it struck me, uh, however, reading your book that, that really there, three forms of assault that uh, the principles that are dear to you and I guess to most of us are under. Uh, one of them is the liberal world um, outside the old west, uh, Russia, China, and so on. And uh, I, I don't think that can be underestimated. I think one of the really striking things watching Chinese behavior at the moment is the extent to which their effort, their inability to tolerate free speech at home is expanding into an inability to tolerate free speech overseas and an effort to control what outsiders say about uh, China. Uh, the global scope of the national security law, for example, which I gather you know, even professors at Princeton and Oxford are now having to think about how they teach their, their, their pupils about China in case they make them liable to prosecution. Um, the, but the second, the, the second and third assaults are really from within uh, you know, the, the core liberal um, bloc. And that I think was what was so unexpected about the Trump era, the, uh, the, to suddenly have a president of the United States turning on the liberal order and saying, you know, this doesn't work, it's, it's a disaster for us. And I think a big question mark about the project that you're sketching out is, you know, Trump is defeated, uh, we hope he's out of office, but Trumpism is still alive, it's still 50% of, uh, the United States or 45 if you prefer and has acolytes in Europe and so on and it's not going to go away um, so how do we uh, deal with that and then I think the other thing is that the, this uh, the, the liberal international tradition is now under assault not just from the left with not just from the right within the west but also from the left uh, with the people saying actually liberal internationalism was just a form of exploitation, uh, neoliberalism at home, uh, kind of the perpetuation of racial privilege overseas, uh, that as you point out, it was, uh, you know, at, 
in the 19th century perfectly compatible with imperialism and that that's no accident you know this is not actually uh, a liberating project it's a kind of oppressive uh, in its nature and i think that that is quite a serious challenge because if the west that club that you refer to is to regain the confidence to defend its values at home promote them overseas it has to believe in them it has to believe that we do stand for something uh, worth defending and uh, that this isn't just so much kind of blah blah when we talk about liberal values um, so then that comes us brings us on to well what does biden do how much ground can can him and his administration reclaim i think uh clearly he's going to go for alliances to try to rebuild american soft power i think probably they'll try to avoid the west terminology because it sounds culturally exclusive and also because a lot of the struggle is now going to be in asia uh it's going to be uh, you know working with asian democracies um i think clearly they're going to have to try to restore the um faith in the project at home, um, what Obama called nation building at home. And I thought it was really interesting that towards the end of your book, having sketched out in, in the book how central the commitment to free trade has been from Cobden on down, you say towards the end, well, perhaps we may have to kind of, you know, put, be a little soft pedal out a bit uh, because it's not clear that we don't have the consent for that. But, you know, what is liberal internationalism if it's not really pushing for, for free trade? Um, I think is, is, is something that uh, we're all going to have to think about. Um, and then the um, accommodation with uh, or convincing people within our own society, but on both the right and the left, that that, that our own order is worth defending is, is I think, key to, to what Biden is going to be doing. Um, and uh, one would like to feel confident. I felt actually a bit more confident having read your book, because I think, as you say, uh, it, it's worth remembering that the kind of triumphalist version of liberal internationalism that we've all been living with for the last 20 years is as much an aberration as, as uh, you know, the, the tradition in its full form. And that historically, this has always been a tradition that A, is full of tensions that, uh, you know, was uh, compatible with imperialism, but that didn't mean that it was actually empty or purely hypocritical, uh, and that has always been embattled. Uh, and you have a number of quotes at the beginning. The one I particularly liked was the one from Roosevelt, uh, which was, a, I, I guess, a version of Obama's arc of history quote, which is that, you know, but I can't remember the exact quote and I have the book, but it's broadly speaking, you know, we, we win more than we lose. We, we lose some, but we gradually we are advancing. And I think that is the, the way to think about it. But I don't think one should, you know, last thought, and uh, sorry if it's a slightly depressing one, but I don't think one should underestimate the profundity of uh, the challenge that the election of Donald Trump and the four years of Trump posed to the liberal worldview. Um, to have the chief sponsor of the system turn on it is not something that will be easily forgotten or remedied. And also, uh, you know, I was discussing with a colleague about how this compared with the crisis of the 1930s, which obviously we've all been thinking about. And this, a person said to me, well, in some ways, it's actually more serious than the 1930s. And I said, oh, come on, you know, now you're being hysterical now. How is it more serious than the 1930s? And the point he made was, well, in the 1930s, Germany was not the most important country in the international system. And it was not the main sponsor of liberal order. It was uh, enormously destructive. But the United States, Britain were, you know, never fell for the, the ideology uh, the illiberal ideology, whereas in, in, in the crisis we're currently going through, we've actually seen the most powerful country in the world um, be led by somebody who does, just does not believe in liberalism and carry a large part of the country with him. And that is a really profound thing that I think we're still going to assimilate uh, as we try to repair the damage. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. But thanks, John. You really got me thinking. Thank you, Gideon. Uh, tough final comments. Um... Certainly the ones that we are all mulling over and waiting to see um, what they lead to, what it leads to. Linda, you're next. Linda, you. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, and uh, thanks very much for inviting me uh, to speak on this uh, round table. I, I became um, very um, excited because it meant I had an excuse to read John's book immediately. 
<laughs> and um, and I think if there was a book at the moment, I agree with Gideon. I think this is the debate at the moment. And so I speak at a lot of events, but I must confess I'm very excited to speak on this one because I think it poses some of the big questions that we all need to engage with from different angles and with a different skill set. And I suppose my skill set in this moment of crisis for liberal internationalism is that I'm an economist. So bear with me as I try and say why <laughs> I have something to add to this um, debate. Um, so the um, when John, actually, John and I spoke on a panel at the LSC when you're writing this book. And I think um, at the time I had a very similar um, uh, perspective on the book I just wrote, where I was looking to solve today's problems, and I ended up writing about 250 years of economic history. Um, and my book, uh, The Great Economist, How Their Ideas Can um, Help Us Today, <laughs> ended up going all the way back um, to Adam Smith in the early part of the 18th century. So I thought what I would do in my comments is maybe just draw out some of those lessons of history for us just all to discuss in terms of what they could add um, from the economics angle to uh, perhaps resolving uh, or moving towards a resolution of this moment of crisis in terms of um, what we find ourselves. So the way I describe it um, is that there's a breakdown in the economic consensus. And so within the definition um, that John, again, I highly recommend everybody read the book, um, trade and openness is an integral part of this, uh, of this system. And the breakdown in economic consensus is associated with the backlash against globalization. So let me just kind of take you back a bit. And let me just stress one thing before I do this, is that um, Mark Twain once said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So everything I say from the past may have some resonance, some more, some less, but I think there are parallels that I think will be helpful. Because as John said, when you look at the tradition of this, he takes it back to the European Enlightenment. And that's essentially my starting point. So um, the Scottish Enlightenment, uh, of which Adam Smith was the product, and um, he was the father of economics, um, was very much when um, developing a consensus around what was driving the Industrial Revolution um, was made. And after 1776 with the Wealth of Nations, um, the arguments for free trade, which is a part of this market economy, um, wasn't really won um, until the Corn Laws were repealed in 1846, which John also writes about. So at that point, it seemed there was a shift in the paradigm and a building of a consensus that this rational approach, the Industrial Revolution, modernity, um, as John describes it, um, and this argument for having free trade changed the consensus away from mercantilism, where countries just like to run trade surpluses, I know many of you are now thinking lots of countries love trade surpluses. <laughs> yes, a history member repeats itself. <laughs> um, but this idea that globalization, openness and specialization and exchange, um, this commercial approach seemed to take hold. But then very quickly, uh, the consensus began to break down and it broke down with the panic of 1873, which is a US railroad financial crisis spread across the Atlantic and led to the Great Depression of the 19th century, which is the long depression. And that was when unemployment appeared in the dictionary for the first time during the Belle Epoque, during the Gilded Age and inequality and all of these things led to a breakdown in the economic consensus, a backlash against this openness, the inequality associated with, with modernity essentially meant that by the early part of the 20th century, 60% of the world's populations lived in either communist or partly socialist countries. So this was not, this was not somehow a small disagreement. This was an, a rejection of the, by that point, term the capitalist system. And capitalism actually was a term not used, not invented by economists. It was actually invented by the author of Vanity Fair as an antonym to Marxism, because Marxism was on the rise in the latter part of the 19th century, and that was also the rise of the trade union movement. So after the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, what you began to see, as I say, was this um, breakdown in economic consensus and then a battle of economic ideas. What is different between, I think, then and now? Lots of things you're thinking. We just talked about the 1930s, Gideon's mentioned it. But one of the things that um, is different is at the time, and there was a choice between reforming 
this market-based economy to eventually include the welfare state, which is how uh, the capitalist system managed to win the battle of ideas really in the post-war period and then it at the t really coming to the end of the Cold War. But the alternative um, was pretty stark. It was um, a choice. There was a communist system um, and that communism and socialism, socialism um, had spread fairly widely. So the difference I think with today is it seems like you can have a market economy without democracy. So that is increasingly, I think, the tension that we're, um, that we're contending with. And yet it's not absolutely clear at this point what that alternative system is. So the Beijing consensus, the China model, it's not actually clear that is that model, and this is coming from um, Chinese academics, um, that it's not, at, and there's a search, I think, for alternatives today. Um, and I think, so again, thinking back to the Cold War, it was pretty clear what the, uh, the divisions were. Not the case everywhere in the world, but fairly clear. Um, but today, there is a search for alternatives the illiberal market economy model doesn't suit a lot of countries. So when I give um, you know, my talks, I often get asked, you know, what is the alternative? Nobody really thinks you're gonna go to um, one of the existing ones. And so to me, that's a sort of difference um, between then and now, which is the, um, it seems there's an attraction to these countries um, which have grown well, uh, there's attractions coming from developing countries, um, including those that haven't grown well under the, um, the Washington consensus, the IMF World Bank US Treasury led model. And I think that's really where um, I'm beginning to see the search for uh, consensus to be um, challenging. So the illiberal political systems with a um, seemingly, you know, um, uh, well-performing economy, I think that's one of the one of the possibilities. But as I say, that's not going to suit everyone. And I think that um, is one of the issues perhaps we can look at. A second issue that I think we ought to look at is, are there such things as universal values? And John alluded to that in his comments. Um, and there's even, so for many people, I think from the uh, Western, um, uh, liberal internationalist perspective, you know, would value, um, would say there are um, a number of values. And yet, um, I think increasingly, even the concept of what is universal in terms of values is being challenged because of this context that we find ourselves. Um, but I wanna say one thing about the separation between economics and politics is if you look sort of, if you lift the cover and look at it slightly more closely. It's not clear to me you can actually separate the two um, as it seems on the surface. I'll just give one example and then um, wrap up. Um, so if you have rights, individual rights um, that are protected by the rule of law, that's only really effective in a democratic system because democratic systems liberal systems respect individual rights. And one of the uh, criticisms of an illiberal system like China is the ineffective um, rule of law. And ultimately without the rule of law underpinning um, the market supporting institutions of the market economy, can you really have a, a, um, a sustainable um, growing um, economy? And that's one of the things I actually write about in one of my books, which is, um, the, uh, if you substitute legal reform for political reform, is that sufficient to support economic growth? Um, and I think the answer there is hard to see how, <laughs> but we can certainly discuss it. Um, so I suppose, you know, my wrapping up, my wrap up thoughts is, you know, it's, it's not clear to me at this point in history where the alternatives are. I think countries in, ter in terms of uh, economic growth, uh, that does tend to drive um, obviously their um, other um, standing in the world. 
So if China falters, does that mean that um, this choice that we seem to be looking at between the two great powers, will that begin to change? Um, and then I want to conclude with a thought that I think Gideon had already mentioned, which is, you know, is the West itself um, divided? Is the West itself um, in a position to, um, there's so much tension within societies also because of this breakdown in the economic consensus. We live in a second gilded age in the United States. There's a backlash against globalization. There's concern over whether or not um, the current system um, is uh, the right one for the 21st century. And there's divisions between the Europeans and the Americans. And if there's not a robust debate about a, a Western position, then the system which is built uh, by the United States and by Britain, you know, can it, can it sustain, can it continue um, without uh, a serious re-examination and a search for a new consensus? And that's the Abraham Lincoln quote, um, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And I think Gideon, you were thinking of the Martin Luther uh, King quote, which is the, or is the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Yeah, yeah. Really. yeah so um, anyways, I'll pause there. I think there's a huge amount to discuss. So thank you. Thank you, Linda, um, a lot there. And I'm sure a lot that John has thought about multiple modernities and that entire question is enormous and continues to be so relevant. Hans Kudinani, um, I have no doubt that you have thoughts on this book and this topic. Well, I should, I should first of all um, apologize. First of all, I should apologize for not being Mark Leonard. Um, and secondly, I should apologize for not having had a chance to read the book yet. Um, what I'd like to do though is to is to actually pick up exactly where John left off um, and I, you know, I guess like everyone else I've been thinking a lot about Biden in the last week um, and so um, I want to talk a bit about what Biden might mean for the liberal international order which as I say is kind of where, where John left off and in particular this sort of question of the relationship between the liberal international order and the west um, which I guess is a different way of saying I mean, the way John puts it is in terms of the inside order and the outside order, but that's roughly the same thing, I think, as the sort of West as the inside order and the post-Cold War liberal international order as the outside order. Um, and a lot of what I'll say, um, it, it draws heavily on Michael Kimmage's book, The Abandonment of the West. Um, Michael's on the, on the call, so he might want to add something uh, afterwards on this. Um, but... What Michael does, I think, in that book is he tells the story of the, the, the history of the idea of the West in US foreign policy. Um, and it's this story of the sort of rise and fall of the Colombian Republic. In other words, this Republic whose identity centered on being part of the West and as leading the West. Um, and that sort of, you know, gains traction in the sort of um, uh, early Cold War period, it kind of starts before then, but really gains traction in the early Cold War period reaches its sort of apotheosis, as, as I understand it, from, from um, uh, around the time of John F. Kennedy and the Ich bin ein Berliner speech. And then from then on, and particularly sort of in the, from the 80s on, um, 70s and 80s on, it sort of loses traction, particularly against the background of multiculturalism. Um, and this sense, which Gideon also talked a bit about, um, that the idea of the West, you know, had too much sort of civilizational, or cultural or kind of baggage um, and so it's lose, it started to lose its sort of traction in US foreign policy debates. Um, and, but what I find really striking and what I hadn't quite sort of seen um, clearly before reading Michael's book was the way that then the liberal international order almost comes along and sort of replaces the West as the sort of central organizing principle of US foreign policy during the Obama administration. And I think Michael talks about um, John, you being the patron saint of the um, Obama administration in that respect. Um, and so anyway, that, you know, that history seems to me quite sort of persuasive in terms of the rise and fall of the West and the way the liberal international order as a concept comes out of it. Um, and then obviously we have this interlude with Trump who sort of rejects all of it. Um, and now Biden has been elected president. And um, I, I guess I'm sort of unsure about where he sort of takes this. Um, on the one hand, you know, there clearly is this impulse in the Biden administration um, to, um, you know, 
make multiculturalism somehow, um, you know, permeate the administration. At the same time, when you listen to the Biden foreign policy folks, um, it seems to me that a lot of them do talk about the West. Um, Gideon was suggesting they wouldn't sort of talk about that. Um, but it seems to me there are quite a lot of, I mean, even more than in the Obama administration, there are particularly there are sort of Atlanticists who, who feel that Atlanticist identity quite strongly and, and, and above all Biden, I guess, in, in, in contrast to, to Obama. Um, and so, you know, and, and then in terms of the rhetoric, you, you know, it does seem as if there's, you know, they do talk about the West quite a lot, it seems to me, but also the free world, you know, which really takes you back um, to the Cold War. Um, and, um, and so I guess, you know, what I'm wondering about is, you know, obviously there'll be a, a sort of struggle between these different factions within, within the administration, but, but if it's true that the, um, the sort of democracy, free world, West kind of faction does have a significant influence on the Biden foreign policy, then um, I guess my question for John really is, is, that, is the logic of this, it was almost, I think, a little implied in, in what you were saying that what, what the, the logic of this is a kind of a reversal of the sort of post-Cold War development of the liberal international order. Then in the sense we go back, you know, we back off from the outside order, um, back into the, into the, the inside order. Um, and um, so I suppose I, I'm wondering also whether it's, you know, I guess you were emphasizing, John, that you can sort of try to do both, but it seems to me there are sort of difficult choices to be made particularly, I think, around this question of to what extent you try to integrate um, non-Western powers, including authoritarian powers, into the order. That, I think, there is a bit of a choice there about, you know, the sort of the, the, the West, the approach that emphasizes the West would be much less um, uh, willing to do that. And as Gideon was saying, it's quite sort of def defensive almost. Um, the logic of the liberal international order, it seems to me, the, the, the outside order is a much more integrative kind of logic. Um, and so just finally, to, to, to link that then to something that, that, that Gideon said, um, I sort of almost wondered, Gideon, when you talked about this, the, the contrast being between the sort of defensive version and the crusader version, I, I think was how you, you put it, I sort of almost wonder whether they're sort of the same thing. Um, that in a funny way, the Crusader version, which is the, the version that, that really goes back to the Cold War and emphasizes the West, is actually kind of the defensive version. Whereas the sort of more liberal version, I guess, in a way, would be, you know, the, staying true to the, the Obama era version of the liberal international order, I guess, would in a sense be more outward looking and more offensive and less defensive but also less um, uh, ideological, um, and in that sense, less of a sort of crusader vision. Thank you, Hans. Um, mine, we have a lot here, and I, I do want to come to questions, but I think it would behoove us to come back to John. Um, and I, I don't want you, John, to answer everything. You couldn't, but you've got multiple modernities. You have a really specific question about, can you have a liberal order without free trade? You've got the big question about inequality and the populace, the assault from within, from the left, from the right, uh, as Gideon um, so usefully said, and from Donald Trump for four years, which isn't going to go away in our memory and perhaps not in our lived experience. Although I, I do want to contest the assumption that everybody who voted for Donald Trump represents the narrow base of Trumpism, which isn't necessarily what you were implying, but I think a lot of people are right now. Um, but John, there's a lot there on the table and this sort of offensive versus defensive liberalism um, frame that, that Hans has given us. So give us some of your reflections and then we'll come to Michael Kimmage for the first question. And I'm sure that we have many, but um, let's hear from you first. Well, first of all, thank you to all of you, uh, 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 Linda, Gideon, Hans, for your, your great comments. and. Uh, you will be stimulating my thoughts for some time to come uh, based on what you said. So I, I will just make a couple comments. I, I, I agree with Gideon that the, the surprise of the, the kind of crisis of liberal order is that the, 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 it came from within, not just from without. And I, I think that's uh, something that, that I, I worry about in the book. I, 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 I don't have 
great answers other than to say that the 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 era when liberal international order seemed to be performing at its highest level uh there was a deep connection between the internationalism that elites were articulating and policies pursued at home to make life better off for everyday people. So the, the, the idea of embedded liberalism, that the internationalism is not to take, uh, take our autonomy away, uh, to take our sovereignty away, but to build a, a, a larger uh, set of, of partnerships and institutions to allow our governments to make good on their promises to their people. And at every moment, whether it's the period which we call the reform liberalism, the late 19th century in Britain, the progressive era, the New Deal era, the Great Society era, I think the Obama period, there were efforts to, to tie the domestic progressive, I mean that in the broadest sense, not the, the narrow politicized sense, progressive uh, developments at home, making so the society more inclusive and better and equal with internationalism, and that's been lost. And so I, I, I think there needs to be a, a kind of domestic corollary to a new internationalism. I think, I think Biden knows that. I think he's gonna to try to tie it up in a, a kind of, he's gonna tie environmental uh, action in, in, in this technology, infrastructure. I think there, the more it's kind of connected to a broader uh, new, um, uh, new effort to re rebuild our societies, that the internationalism becomes part of that and becomes legitimated on the basis of that. I, at least that's what history tells me is necessary. I do think along the way that trade has to be re readjusted as, a, as an ideology. I, I, I think a, a free trade probably is not what we want, but, but managed interdependence we don't, it's liberal internationalism. The liberal project is not about promoting globalism. It's about managing interdependence. And that got lost. It probably gets lost when you get on an airplane, and you go to Davos. Somewhere along the line at 30,000 feet, you start talking about globalization. You forget that it's about managing inter interdependence. But Danny Roderick, I think is right that, that you've got to find a way to I, so I do think we're in for a, a little bit more, not mercantilism, but more managed state state uh, involvement. And I don't think we can escape it, but I think we need to make it um, liberal, international in the sense that it should be uh, tied to principles of, 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 of reciprocity, uh, uh, most favored nation, non, non uh, uh, exclusive forms, uh, non-imperial zones. I, so I think there are ways to, to moderate that new uh, kind of effort by states to, to tie trade to, to, to social uh, stability. Um, I, I, Hans and, and Linda make very great po points. I, I, I think that China is, and I, it's really related to, to Gideon's point, um, I think it is a challenge that is more profound than simply a geopolitical challenge. I think there is a, as as uh, Jurgen Habermas called it, a, a, a modernity project that China, that President Xi sees in his most aspirational thinking, uh, uh, what the, what China is about. It's it's about an alternative project. Uh, I'm skeptical of it, uh, but I think it's there's going to be it's big enough to make to make it not fail in the short or medium term. Um, uh, and I think that could be a positive, it could, could force uh, liberal societies that want to keep openness and their values to, to up their game. Um, and what I, and this is my last point, is simply that this kind of the West and liberal internationalism. The term liberal international order uh, did not appear in the New York Times until 2005. And the first scholarly use of the term was actually um, an article I wrote in 1999 uh, with Dan Dudney in a British journal. Um, I've only found one use of the term liberal international order in any time before 1999, and that was in a, in a, a Near Eastern Studies, uh, no, Far Eastern Studies uh, journal published in 1944. Uh, Michael Doyle showed, showed me the citation. But I think the term has been was, was used, I was kind of, almost appalled by the explosion of its use uh, because I had a more technical uh, 
uh, idea in mind for the, for the term, but but people were looking and still are for something to capture a a complex of relationships and a a way of life that that we've we've lived through that 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 has been uh, progressive for many many people, and we feel like we're going to lose it. So. What is it we're going to lose? Well, it's not the West. It's something else because it's not simply a ge geographical space. And part of what I'm trying to do in this book is de-link liberal internationalism from hegemony and the West and make it a more mobile set of ideas. That, and indeed, at the end of the book, I, I and in the foreign affairs articles, try to talk about, I, I call it D10. I Others have talked about this, a coalition that is not a Western coalition. It's certainly, I go to South Korea every year, have a very strong ties to Japan and, 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 and indeed to other countries in East Asia. And that's where a lot of the action is. There's a lot of energy um, at, in middle tier countries, middle, middle power countries, uh, Canada and Australia for, for a kind of new era, a rebirth of some kind of complex uh, multilateralism that's tied to liberal democratic values. And so I, I'm very positive about that. And it's important to make it not a story of American uh, hegemony, although I do think that the US has got to play a positive role because Trump has showed us how bad it can get when the US is on the wrong side is playing on the wrong team. Uh, we've got to switch teams. <laughs> uh, Gideon. We're trying, John. We've been to, we're, we're trying to switch teams. Uh, I mean, not everybody, but some of us are. Um, so I'm going to take a couple of questions just to get some more, because there's so many good people in the room. So uh, first, we're going to go to Michael Kimbage, then we're going to Marriott Leslie, and then Charles Grant. Well, first of all, thank you for including me in this in this in this wonderful conversation. I want to honor all of the distinctions you just drew a moment ago, John, between the West and the liberal international order, but at the same time, ask a question that will blur uh, a few of those distinctions. In my own research on the the West, what I was struck by is how important the cultural underpinnings were, and Hans mentioned this uh, a moment ago, and I could parse a couple of comments from this discussion by saying the basic cultural underpinning of the West was the Enlightenment, uh, and I think that. Is, is, seems to be largely true for the liberal international order uh, as well. And it wasn't just critiques from the multicultural left that came about in the some 60s and 70s that challenged the notion of the West. Uh, it was also a challenge that emerged from the right, especially in the 70s and 80s. And Pat Buchanan, I was sort of struck by how many of his books hit themes that Trump would hit uh, as a president, but he too tried to sort of pull the underpinnings uh, out from this order. And so it's been a you know sort of complicated multi-pronged uh, evolution in terms of uh, the West and its critics or later liberal international order uh, and its critics. But the question is, how do we see the culture into under, cultural underpinnings of the liberal international order now? And how do we see the, the sort of status of the enlightenment? It seems to me that it's not just Trump and Trumpism that's the problem. It's an information space that is full of irrationality, you know, very knee jerk, full of all kinds of emotive um, tendencies. Social media really seems to uh, accentuate this. Um, you know, the failure of Trump uh, in his second term perhaps suggests that there's a limit to this, there's sort of a limit to how much can be manipulated and, uh, you know, sort of mythologized in the public space. But I'm curious to see how optimistic you are about the culture of the Enlightenment going forward. And perhaps you have some thoughts or ideas about how we can constructively build out that culture uh, and make it wider and more uh, and more stable. But that seems to me as urgently as important as any of the particular foreign policy agendas uh, of the coming Biden administration? That's a tremendous question and it's gonna be painful for John to have to wait, but you've got to wait, John. Um, I'll come to you, uh, Marriott Leslie, if you want. And great to see you here. If you could say who you are too, if you could introduce yourself. Uh, it's great to be here. And I thought that was a really good discussion. My question was actually very similar uh, to the last one, which is I was very struck by all of our panelists discussing liberal internationalism as though it were a political, societal, economic project, but no reference to the scientific method. And I'd be really interested to see whether they think an essential part of the liberal international project 
is its link to a particular Western enlightenment view of the scientific method based on empirical evidence, fact checking, data that once established um, is universally accepted until disproven by a new set of data. Um, because it seems to me that might be one of the keys both to Linda's question about whether a closed society is compatible with a market economy and also to the societal question and challenge for us in what used to be called the West of how we move on from here at a time when that spirit of scientific inquiry is actually contested in our own societies. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful question from Marriott Leslie, who, as we all know, former British diplomat whose last post was as permanent representative to NATO, and I believe is based in Scotland now, but don't quote me. Um, next, we have Charles Grant. Thank you, Leslie. I, I'm from the, the Centre for European Reform, as you know. I, do, I want to dare to mention something called the European Union. Uh, John talked about the, the liberal international order as if it was a sort of totally an Anglo-Saxon invention. And he may be right about the history of it. I'm, I'm sure he is right. But seen from Brussels and Paris today, that's not how it looks. The Anglo-Saxon countries produced Boris Johnson and Donald Trump. Emmanuel Macron sees himself as the defender of there's something called strategic autonomy, which is the buzzword in Brussels and Paris and in some degree in Berlin as well. Everybody in, is talking about strategic autonomy, seeing it as an insurance policy against the risk that Trump or Trumpism will return and that China will get so strong that it will be able to bully the EU to do what it wants. Uh, so I think Macron's trying very hard. The difficulty, of course, is getting 27 countries to sign up to this because some countries see the concept of strategic autonomy as anti-American or anti-Atlanticist. And getting the, po the polls, for example, to, to accept that, that it's not necessarily anti-data is very difficult. But I think it's, it's, I think actually this is the way forward. I think, I think Macron is actually right to see a, a strategically autonomous Europe as, as a defense against uh, the, the threats to the liberal international order. And just to say, it's not just about defense, of course. It's also about, as Macron sees, it's about, it's about uh, data. It's about data. It's about not being dependent on another country for energy supplies. It's about having some tech giants that you, you can call your own. It's about data. It's about all sorts of things in addition to defense. But I think, it's, I think he's on the right, the right lines as far as I can see. And they, 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 they don't see the Anglo-Saxon order as, they don't see the liberal international order as an Anglo-Saxon concept at all in Brussels or Paris. John, I'll come to you first to offer something. No, I, that's, I don't see it that way either. I see it as very much coming out of the, the very ideas I suggest in the book of, of the liberal era began a post French Revolution with Europeans, Germans and French uh, among them conjuring principles that would allow societies to navigate between the revolutionary um, aspirations of high French Revolution and the conservative backlash. Uh, it's so there's there's so many different the DNA and the experiments are, are, are sprawl across the uh, the, the, uh, the, the world and, 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 and indeed, uh, as I spent a lot of time in the book talking about the post-World War II era, it's a story of Europe, of, of, of it's the revolution in relations between Germany and France. And it's the, uh, as we, as Gideon has kind of reminded us that we need to defend the liberal order if we're going to save it. We need to remind people that it's been doing things. Uh, uh, what it's done perhaps more than anything uh, as I suggest in the book, is create a post-war framework for industrial societies to make a century-long transition from their 19th century laissez-faire, uh, limited government uh, 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 precursors to, to, uh, to modern social democracies. And that was done differently in Germany under the social market, uh, in France, in Britain, in the United States, uh, and um, in different ways in Asia. So so I, I definitely think that we should be uh, not narrowing the brand, so to speak, and the historical reference of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the tradition and of the thinking. I, I guess the, I'll just, I know we're running out of time, so I'll just say one thing about the Enlightenment, <laughs> uh, which I think the, the, uh, uh, Michael and, and, and uh, uh, Merritt were, were both uh, making comment on. Uh, <laughs> and that is just to say, I do think that the liberal era began the liberal ascendancy uh, from, you know, which began in the, in the late 18, 1800s, uh, 18th century, 
uh, was an enlightenment, uh, was driven by the enlightenment, uh, and uh, uh, and that it in, entailed a, a kind of set of the discovery of modernity, a sense that our countries are in motion driven by science, technology, and industrialism, and that that is creating great opportunities and, and great uh, 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 challenges, uh, and but that uh, enlightened self-interest would be necessary to navigate and build institutions that could bias the flow of events in, a po in positive directions, that reason and science and discourse and um, testing hypotheses, all of this I do think is part of, of, of the tradition that, and it separates it from other grand traditions uh, on the right and on the left. So uh, I don't think we can cut loose you know, it's sort of like the raft of Medusa. We can't cut loose from from the shores, from the from the Enlightenment. And I think it is a. a I, 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 my bet is that those societies that do cut loose are going to run 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 into walls and run off cliffs. Uh, 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 that, that 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 there is a kind of functionality test to societies. It's not just ideology and beliefs, but can you do things well? And I think Trump is showing his ideology, which is probably post-enlightenment. You make up facts. Uh, you don't uh, trust science. Is is going to be coded by history as a catastrophic failure. And you can only not see that if, if you live inside of a, a, a kind of post-fact bubble that uh, makes kind of makes up narratives so if that you know so i so it's not that everything's going to turn back to a kind of enlightenment optimism but there but but the those of us who live in the enlightenment societies and subsystems are going to perform better that's my my guess so uh therein will tell us the tale i think so I'm going to take one more round and then let each of the panelists have a, a closing remark um, since we only have about eight minutes left um, rather than coming back to the panelists now. So Derek West, Angela Polk, Sarah Kerala, and Pedro. So if you can be really succinct in your questions because we, we don't have a lot of time left. Thank you very much. And thank you for a very um, rich presentation which speaks also to um, readings that I've done with colleagues at the LSE Ideas recently on your um, questioning of the sustainability of the liberal international order. Um, you referenced um, that the um, liberalism was embedded at one point. It was um, clear that it, it has come loose in some regards. So um, how do you see um, liberalism re-embedding? Where, where does that occur? Um, does it occur in a Bretton Woods system that is updated and what does that updated system look like? Um, and, and you also referenced on this talk, um, you're spending a lot of time with democratic nations in, um, in the East, in the Far East. Is there, you know, is there a sense that one opens up and reorients and, um, and that Bretton Woods 2.0 looks different and perhaps reoriented? Great question. And then Andres Pedraza. I can read out the question. It's Professor Eikenberry, you are quoting Woodrow Wilson, a world safe for democracy. How can you reconcile the liberal tradition with the racism of Woodrow Wilson? Does liberal internationalism have its limits nowadays? Great question, not least because as we know, John is a very distinguished professor at what was formerly known the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, John, I think we'll take uh, well, we're, I'm going to come to you last because I want you to have the last word on this panel. We have five minutes, panelists, exercise restraint. Um, Hans, I'm going to we're, we're going to go in reverse order, so you exercise restraint, Hans. But please, I will. I, I will. I'll be very brief um, because I want others to have more time, particularly John. Um, I just think this question of whether it is possible. I mean, I, I thought that the way that John ended was absolutely fascinating. The sort of idea that um, you know, the, the question of whether you can sort of um, you know, as you, as you put it, John, make liberal internationalism a more mobile set of values and sort of detach it from its particular um, cultural, civilizational kind of origins. Um, and 
I, and I think this is also what the question about Wilson's racism gets to as well. And, and I think that is the, the question. I'm, I'm not sure whether it's possible to do it, but I think that is precisely the, the interesting question, particularly around democracy, whether we can sort of um, make democracy a new organizing principle that is universal and is not um, uh, Eurocentric, um, but at the same time, um, you know, doesn't pull us back into this kind of Cold War paradigm. And, and as I say, that's very much the feeling I get from, from listening to the, to the Biden folks is that they're taking us back to a Cold War paradigm. Thank you, Hans. Linda. Um, well, I'm certainly going to be more optimistic than Hans there on his last question. <laughs> but very good question. Um, um, I was actually I'm going to raise, um, I mean, all these are fantastic questions. I know we don't have any time. So I'm just going to cut to it and say, I think one of the most interesting developments is um, what's great about John's book is um, this concept of, the, of this current world order, however you want to, the definition of it, it's fluid, it's based in values as well as scientific inquiry. So let's move ahead to next summer. Uh, the UK proposes to create a democracy group, the D10, um, which I've heard is a G7 plus three. So that is, um, and it kind of touches on a couple of the questions. So that kind of uh, uh, organization is defined by shared values like democracy. That by definition excludes non-democracies like China. So if this goes forward, the line is literally drawn. And can you have a global order where the second biggest economy in the world, um, which is needed to set global rules, sits outside of, um, assuming this grouping takes place or some other form of it, um, is that feasible? And then within that grouping itself, my understanding is there are debates about who should be included, who are the plus three. The plus three are not all the West, although as a, you know, <laughs> as an economist who writes about Western e economies, Japan gets included all the time and it's not the West, but it's sort of grouped like that. And sometimes I think South Korea gets grouped like that, but is it really right to group India like that, traditionally sort of politically neutral. So to me, um, you know, maybe that's the, uh, that's one of the questions, Leslie, we'll just have to come back to on another round table, <laughs> I'm sure, and bring so, you know, some, of the, <laughs> some of the democracies, the D10, all those proposals most definitely deserve, deserve their own discussion. Uh, Gideon. Yeah, th thanks. Um, just on, on that, Nice point. I mean, it, it is very interesting because, of course, not all the possible D10s will have uh, stellar democratic credentials. I mean, do you? Uh, is, so, which brings the, us back to this question: Is it about uh, power projection, or is it about values, and what is the overlap between the two? But the, the the remark that I wanted to end on or pick up on was John's saying that he what he was trying to do was to disconnect American hegemony from liberal internationalism. And that too, I think, is a very interesting and possibly fraught project because I wonder whether part of the reason that America in the past four years turned away from liberal internationalism was that it was no longer synonymous with American hegemony. That, uh, you know, in the old days, uh, as you recount in the book, America practiced its hegemony very politely, it discussed uh, and it consulted, and occasionally it would take others considerations on board. But in the end, it was clearly the, 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 the agenda setter, the rule setter. And I think that a lot of what Trump was about was saying, you know what, this system doesn't work for us anymore. The WTO doesn't work for us anymore. The WHO doesn't work for us. So we're just going to walk away from these liberal institutions. You suggest in the book that actually a less powerful America should be more attracted to uh, liberal internationalism because it's a way of, um, of of convening you know more power and, and creating more allies but it also involves compromises and whether America is prepared to make those kinds of compromises in the interests of reviving inter liberal internationalism I think is, is really interesting I think there's some parallel with Brexit where Britain which had been used to being the superpower joined the European Union as a sort of uh, a way of uh, kind of getting other benefits, but in the end decided that the compromises on sovereignty, et cetera, were not acceptable to it, and perhaps rather self-defeatingly decided to walk away. And now whether, I wonder whether that in a, 
in miniature is a danger of the, that America has been doing and may continue to do the same thing. Just say, look, we're really not interested in the liberal international order that involves too many compromises where we don't run the show anymore. Yeah. Um, John, over yeah, to you for the final on, on that point, I, I, that's, I, that could well happen, and some Americans will make that argument. But the other argument is that the U.S. has, in some sense, been humbled by this Trump years, and it shows that the strong version of hegemonic order where you bet bully and unilaterally uh, attempt to rule is, is a disaster, and, and a more humble America may think that it needs other states more than, than uh, the the right-wing America first alternative uh, thought thought it did. So there, it depends on how we learn and how we, we process the Trump years. I, I wanted just my last comment to be about Woodrow Wilson and about racism. I, I think that liberalism, like every other world uh, view, every other great political tradition has dirty hands. Uh, 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 all the the individuals who have been the, the thinkers and the doers of, of any great tradition, whether it's Marxist communism or uh, uh, certainly uh, the ones on the right, uh, uh, have uh, cannot defend their ideas simply on the uh, purity of the lives who have been the proponents of those ideas. It was, I think, Oscar Wilde who said, uh, the value of an idea is not determined by the sincerity of the person who utters the, that idea. And Wilson was, uh, was a racist, but did utter ideas that uh, had some value in and of themselves. And you have to, in some sense, separate uh, the dancer from the dance. Uh, he was a flawed, morally blind figure who was, one, had one foot in liberal, liberal America and one foot in alt America. And of course, Trump has both feet in alt America, but there is a liberal America. And the liberal America is the America of the preamble, the declaration of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, of the, of the liberal vision that has been on the side of overcoming and putting down and, and, rec and coming to reckon with the, 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 the injustices that uh, were part of the original sin of, of, the, of the founding and, and of other societies as well. So I don't see how you get to a better place where there's less racism in modern societies without the liberal vision and, the, and liberalism as an ally of, of other groups wanting to make things better. I, I, the principles are there and I don't see an alternative set of ideas harnessed to grand historical movements that can, that can take you there. So I think you're stuck with, if you want uh, a, a more equal, more just society, I think you're stuck working within the ideas and aspirations that have come out of this liberal age. There's a lot there for us to um, digest. And that was that was really a remarkable set of contributions. I think it's... Um... I think it's Chatham House at its best, bringing all of you together. Certainly, John at its be at his best. So that's a pretty high standard. Gideon, Hans, and Linda, really thank you so much. There's a lot to think through. Don't forget about the book. Um, it is it is a beautiful book, really. It's and I don't just mean the cover. That the words are chosen very beautifully and it's very eloquent. So I highly recommend that you read it and enjoy it and reflect on it in light of today's conversation, which will be recorded. Um, you can go back and re-listen and share it. And um, John, please come to Chatham House again. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I know it's one of many conversations that we've had. One was at Rules, which I thought was particularly appropriate. Uh, it was followed by a dinner at Rules, mm -hmm. and hopefully we can do that again on your next visit over. But thank you so much, and thanks to all the panelists for making the time and all the great questions.